On top of a dreary mountain directly below the pink moon, a lone woman is held in chains against her will. While she's unconscious, a mysterious group of hooded figures in the background prays over her. It seems that she's acting as a sacrifice of some sort. As she comes to her senses, the woman meekly asks for help. Suddenly, an enormous dragon appears before her, and just as it's about to devour the woman whole, she uses all her might to break free from the chains. With a gleaming greatsword in her hands, she's ready to face the monster head on. One of the hooded figures suddenly reveals his true identity, announcing that they'll now initiate the sealing ceremony. By the power of the sealing treasure, the sword of God, and the holy mirror, the evil dragon Daganzot will be sealed in a prison of eternal time. As the man named Lord Bairo leads the ceremony, he gets pierced in the back, despite this, he instructs the others to continue the ritual, or else the soul-destroying flames of Daganzot will consume their land. Unfortunately, Daganzot breaks free from the crystal enclosing its body and attacks Hero, Lord Bairo's son. Lord Bairo uses the last ebbs of his magic to prevent the dragon from harming his child. A blinding explosion then ensues, creating smoke clouds throughout the desert. Everything then fades into the darkness. One tranquil night, a cloaked traveler arrives at a town. As he's walking around, a wealthy man named Nambuko arrives to give away coins to the townspeople. The traveler comes across a shop that apparently bears the crest of Dragon Warding. The story behind this insignia involves the mystical Dalhalbart, who's claimed to have saved the golden maiden Pishuktram from the deadly claws of a raging dragon. However, the people say that the crest must be a fake since there's been no sign of Daganzot for the past 10 years. Suddenly, the crest gets snatched by a little kid. The shop owner's henchman catches him, but the traveler comes to the young boy's rescue, pointing his massive sword at the muscular giant. The traveler hands the shop owner one gold coin in exchange for the crest, and immediately, the owner sets the kid free. The little boy doesn't show any gratitude, though as he was supposed to cause a fuss and have his buddy steal the townspeople's wallets. Before he runs away, he takes the crest away from the traveler and shouts that he'll keep it as a fee. The traveler discovers the little boy's hideaway and retrieves the crest. He introduces himself as Hiro, the now grown-up son of Lord Byro, who once attempted to seal Daganzot. Hiro asks the kid for his name, and he replies that he's called Tomitha. Meanwhile, a gray-haired man roams around town looking for Hiro. The villagers, and even his assistant Parupa, are fearful of the man's scarred appearance, but he continues the search for the young boy. Nambuko meets with the town lord, convincing him to sell their entire supply of magicite. The government official replies that if he sells all their resources, prices will go up, and people will subsequently protest. But Nambuko merely tells him, it's easy to silence the masses, isn't it? As they're having the meeting, one of Nambuko's servants breaks one of the lord's important pottery pieces. The lord gets worked up, but he's immediately kept in check by Nambuko's very own private army. The greedy merchant says fear is the simplest way to control the public. Nambuko shows the lord the Grand Troa, and his servant says that they can use it for his benefit if he wishes. The lord gets excited at the thought of using the object, but he's concerned about his political reputation. While converting Sing, a little kid attempts to loot the Grand Troa but is easily seized by Nambuko's servant. Meanwhile, Hiro's being pursued by Tomitha and his buddies. Their chase comes to a halt when one of the kids nearly falls off the roof several meters to the ground. Hiro manages to save the kid, which leaves Tomitha appeased. However, the young boy's relief is short-lived, as another one of his buddies arrives to inform him that Peshate, the kid who attempted to steal the Grand Troa, has been captured. He's told that Peshate is to be publicly executed at dawn. Peshate is all tied up with a rope at the town square and is unforgivable givingly presented to the public. They intend to make his execution available for the townspeople to see. Peshata's companions are undoubtedly anxious, but Hiro tells Tomitha to leave it to him. He shows himself to Nambuko's foxy servant, who's overseeing the execution. Hiro claims that Peshate may not be completely guilt-free, but the death penalty is simply going too far. The servant asks him who he is, and he curtly replies with his name, describing himself as a wandering swordsman. The servant orders an army of men with swords to lunge at Hiro, yet he defeats each of them flawlessly. However, as soon as he draws his sword, he's puzzled as to why he can't cut down his enemies. His sword seems so dull that it can't even inflict a cut on his foes. Suddenly, the older man looking for him comes to his assistance, calling him Young Master Hero. By the looks of it, the man with the frightful exterior serves under Hero. Parupa arrives as well and hands Hero the scabbard for his sword. He tells the older man that it's his fault for telling Hero it'd only take 10 years for him to become a master swordsman. Upon hearing this comment, Hero angrily insists that he is a handler of the blade. The creature proceeds to ask him how much better he's got with his sword, but the boy merely responds with silence. Parupa reprimands Hiro, saying that the idea he could defeat Daganzot at this level isn't even funny. Nambuko's servant interrupts them and says that she'll execute them all. She takes out the Grand Troa, and Hiro recognizes this as his father's sealing treasure. The girl uses the glowing object to attack them, but she's unexpectedly flung back by an unfamiliar power. Soon enough, Hiro is in shock as the Daganzot manifests itself.
itself before their very eyes. As such, the unnerving energy source lies within the newly awakened dragon. What's strange is that it seems Hero and Dagon Zot share a similar looking scar. Long ago, the continent of Kunan was ruled by swords and sorcery. Three powerful countries existed, the Kingdom of St. Amoria, the Kingdom of Ishilfin, and the Kingdom of Van Lodis. They were all equally powerful, and it was clear that any trouble in one area would immediately escalate into a continent-wide war. However, there was an evil dragon on the land that all inhabitants feared, Dagon Zot. It came from the shadows to scorch the earth and consume the souls of humanity. Back to the present, Hero, overcome with resentment towards the nefarious dragon, charges at the creature without thinking of the consequences. Obviously, the dragon has the upper hand, and before Hero can even leave a scratch on the beast's body, he loses consciousness. The gray-haired man rushes to Hero's side and tries to wake him up. Nambuko's army starts firing arrows at Dagon Zot, but their efforts are futile. Airborne projectiles are everywhere, and Hero and the older man are about to be struck when Dagon Zot unexpectedly protects them. Nambuko's servant is shocked when she witnesses this. After momentarily terrorizing the townspeople and destroying some parts of the town square, Dagon Zot retreats below the earth. Surprisingly, Nambuko is pleased with Dagon Zot's appearance. He tells the Lord that the people will fear Dagon Zot, and in their panic, they will kneel before the Lord, begging for protection. At Tomitha's place, the older man named Giru is tending to a still unconscious hero. He recounts how, ten years ago, Lord Bairo and his wife, Kismetete, attempted to seal Dagon Zot away. Parupa adds that this event is labeled as the disaster at Balbagoa. With this, Parupa is curious why Hero's parents picked the buffer zone between the countries to seal the creature. The explanation is simple. All three kingdoms feared Dagon Zot to the point where they didn't want to do the sealing exclusively in their own country. As a result, the buffer zone was chosen. The noble soul of Kismetete was used to lure Dagon Zot, and with the family's mystical objects combined with the power of a hundred mages, the ritual seemed like it would succeed. But Lord Bairo, as well as the mages and hordes of the three kingdom soldiers, was engulfed in the soul-devouring flames. Anyone slain by this inferno can't be resurrected by any magic. Soon, Hero wakes up and frantically looks for Dagon Zot, insisting that he must defeat the beast. Tomitha tells him, Are you stupid? Even a hundred mages couldn't beat him. Hero retaliates by mentioning that he specifically trained for this day. He continuously refined his skills for ten years to avenge his parents under the watch of Giru. However, Tomitha replies that if he expects to get positive results just because he worked hard, he's a moron. Bashata mentions that the Grand Troa can grant any wish, so Hero could use it to defeat Dagon Zot. Hero says he's sure his father was trying to do the same thing. If he can get the Grand Troa back, he can fulfill his objective. The fledging swordsman asks Tomitha where Nambuko is, is, but he replies that the swindler has already left. The boy adds that Nambuko's an arms merchant trying to make countries fight each other so he could get rich. Each time he comes to the town, he purchases magic stones for nearly zero cost, so thanks to him, the lord of their village is flat broke. With that, Hiro decides to look for Nambuko and retrieve the Grand Troa to defeat Dagon Zot. Meanwhile, Nambuko's servant girl, Shari Sharu, inquires about her master's whereabouts. She's told that her master has returned to the land where wishes die. Upon hearing this information, she approaches a nearby fountain and, with her magic, uses the water to contact Nambuko. Her master orders her to find Hiro. Hiro, Giru, and Parupa take a break from finding Nambuko, and have their stomachs filled. After being rejected by various restaurants for opposing the influential Nambuko, a cat girl leads them to a place where they're free to eat. The voluptuous lady asks Hiro what Dagan Zot was even doing there, whether it had something to do with him being Bairo's son. Her perceptiveness alerts him and Giru. How does she know this information? When pressed, she dodges their questions and instead introduces herself as Eren. That night, they decide to crash at Tomitha's place since Parupa doesn't want to spend any more money on an inn. The following morning, Giro's the first to get up. He sharpens his knife to make breakfast, and the kids have a hearty banquet that morning. After eating, Giro says that Hiro can't run after the Grand Troa just yet. His skills as a swordsman are still unpolished, so if he goes out into the wilderness now, he'll encounter monsters he can't even imagine. Giro tells Hiro that his present obligation is to become a better swordsman who can survive on the road. They'll stay at the place for a while as he learns how to fight monsters. Tomitha initially opposed this saying they were supposed to stay in his room for one night. However, Hiro bribes him by saying that Giru will cook every day, and with that suggestion, he can't resist any longer. Later that day, Giru and Parupa commence Hiro's training. Giru first assigns him to face off some slimes. Hiro thinks this task will be a piece of cake, but it turns out he has trouble defeating even the baby slimes. As Hiro struggles with the most basic of monsters, Giru is off to defeat stronger creatures to stock up on cash. Parupa is left behind to supervise the aspiring swordsman. Suddenly, a sand dragon shows up just behind Parupa. Parupa. Hiro lunges toward it, but his sword inflicts no damage. Parupa asks Hiro to run, but he insists on playing the role of the hero. As the sand dragon opens its mouth, Hiro notices a girl safely sitting inside. 
she disembarks from her ride and bids the creature goodbye with a word of thanks. Out of nowhere, the girl places her ear on Hiro's chest and says that she likes the beautiful sound of his heartbeat. She asks him to come with her, leaving him completely aghast. Parupa thinks the girl is nothing but trouble, since she just came out from the mouth of a sand dragon holding a magic wand. He asks her where they'll go, and she replies, wherever he is. The girl reveals her name is Sarato. Suddenly, Giru arrives, bringing the remains of the monsters he vanquished with him. The man asks Hiro who the girl is, but the young boy replies that he doesn't know as she just came out of nowhere. Giru prepares to attack Sarato, but Hiro stops him. She calls Hiro's attention to say that she found some pretty pebbles. Hiro, Giru, and Parupa all agree to just ignore her, and they all flee while she's busy collecting stones. Back at Tomita's place, Hiro's spacing out, and Tomita catches his attention. The little kid teases Hiro, asking if Sarato's still on his mind. He denies this accusation, but Tomita unsurprisingly doesn't believe him. Hiro gets worked up and says he's focused on defeating Daganzot, adding that he doesn't have time for girls. It's just that Sarato seemed unhappy like she was all alone. Tomita replies that she can always make new friends if she's lonely. Meanwhile, Sharisharu and Nambuko's army are all over town hunting for Hiro. She uses her magic to find him, but her enchanted mirror doesn't seem functional. Sarato passes by them as she explores the town, and a cloaked figure in the shadows is seen to have their eye on her. Inside Nambuko's cave, he communicates with a few individuals individuals working under him. He commands one of them to inform the palace that Daganzot has been revived. He says he's already made the necessary arrangements with all the countries. Once you start a rumor, the people's natural fear of the dragon will take care of the rest. He tells another one of his servants that he wants a massive increase in magic stone production. Nambuko also speaks to a man named Dr. Bafalopa, saying that war is looming around the corner. The kings of the three countries will struggle to acquire the largest supply of weapons, so he would want to take advantage of this chance. He orders the mad scientist to develop some new product that they'll demand, something more powerful than they've ever witnessed. After this brief exchange with Nambuko, the doctor wonders if Sarato is okay. It turns out she's discovered where Hiro is hiding, and now she's at Tomita's place. The little kid asks how she learned about that place, and she replies that she can find things important to her. She tells Hiro, where you are is where I am. Aww, how cute! She immediately got attached to Hiro after having a really short conversation with him. Tomita teases Hiro, saying that the fight with Daganzot has to be postponed. Hiro insists that Sarato was alone in the desert and needed his help. Parupa asks if he's letting her stay there. Hiro responds, One more person shouldn't make too much of a difference, right? Fortunately, Tomita tells him not to worry. The next day, Parupa sells the monsters Giru has slain. He's disappointed that the combined bounty costs less than he thought. They can't even buy weapons with the money they obtained. Thus, Giru decides to go hunting one more. Hiro is accompanied by Sarata to his training, where he still struggles to crush some slimes. Suddenly, a hostile, wolf-like monster, similar to the one Giro hunted, appears at the training grounds. Hiro faces it, but he's easily thrown away like garbage in need of disposal. The monster focuses on Sarato, bearing its fangs at her. Hiro doesn't give up and attacks the creature one last time. This time, he successfully manages to defeat the monster. He rushes to Sarato's side and notes that she must have fallen asleep. She doesn't even remember the monster coming its way to attack her. She notices Hiro's injury, and using her magic wand, she heals his wounds, even fixing his torn clothes. They journey off to town and sell the defeated monster. Hiro's pretty disappointed that all he got out of that debacle was one gold coin. As they're walking across the streets, they come across a man who's forcefully asked to work at the magic stone mines. Hiro interferes, but he gets carried off by the soldiers too, so Sarato is left alone. Tomitha and Parupa arrive to ask her what happened. At the prison where he's being held captive, Hiro talks to the man he attempted to rescue. The man says that once you go to the mines, you will never return. Hiro tries to boost his fellow prisoners' morale by telling them not to give up. He's optimistic that there's a clear way out. He shows them the fake crest, but they don't get their hopes up over this. Meanwhile, a soldier belonging to Nambuko's army reports to Shari Sharu that Hiro's being held captive at the Lord's Palace. Tomitha finds an escape route that he hopes will lead him to save Hiro, and Sarato trails closely behind. On the other hand, Hiro is desperately trying to crack down the wall using the fake crest. However, the other prisoners don't seem too hopeful that they can escape. Tomitha and Sarato arrive at the Lord's room using the escape route they passed through. They find out he's keeping dual ledgers to embezzle the king's money. Tomitha attempts to blackmail him, saying that if he took the register to the palace, what would happen? The Lord implores him to give it back, but Tomitha says that he has conditions before he'll do so. One, let the boy in prison go, and two, set the people he enslaved in the mines free. The Lord's army arrives and they pin Tomitha down. Even Sarato is being held against her will, but Giru and Parupa arrive right on time, saving them both. 
Hiro and the other prisoners are given independence in exchange for the Lord's Ledger. It took one pointed sword from Giru to reduce the Lord into being cowering out of fear. That night, Shari Sharu arrives late at the Lord's palace and finds that Hiro has already been released. She gets completely frustrated over this. On the other hand, the men who were taken captive together with Hiro plan to go home to their families. Hiro says he doesn't really remember anything about having a family, but there are some other things that he definitely remembers. With the knowledge he's gained and the bewildering experiences he's gone through, Hiro is surely on his way to defeating Daganzot. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.